Hello. Welcome to the Program on Negotiations Virtual Faculty Session with Professors Joel Kutcher Gershenfeld and Kimberlyn Leary. Their discussion today will be on negotiated change during and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Susan Hackley. I'm the Managing Director at the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School, a consortium program of Harvard, MIT, and Tufts University. We are delighted you're joining us, really from all over the world. Welcome, and we hope you are well. This will be recorded, and it will be posted on the Program on Negotiation website in a few days. The slides that you see today will be posted later as a PDF. Helping us today from PON will be Diane Long and Anna Chang. They'll be facilitating the Q&A. Now, a few ground rules. Please use mute now and during the session, except when you may be speaking. That helps reduce background noise. If you have a question, please use the raise your hand function and the speakers may call on you. Or use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to write a question. If you find that your internet speed is slow, you may need to turn off your camera to improve quality. Now I'll briefly introduce our speakers and we'll get started. Joel Kutcher Gershenfeld is a professor at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. And he's the editor of the Program on Negotiations, Negotiation Journal. He is an expert in large scale systems change, negotiation and employment relations. He served as the Dean of the School of Labor and Employment Relations at the University of Illinois, and he's a past president of the Labor and Employment Relations Association. Joel has written, edited, and contributed to many books, articles, and policy papers, and has facilitated large-scale change initiatives in countries around the world. Kimberlyn Leary is Associate Professor of Psychology at Harvard Medical School and Associate Professor of Health Policy and Management at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. During the Obama administration, she served as an advisor to the White House Council on Women and Girls and as an advisor to the White House Office of Management and Budgets Health Division. She consults widely on enhancing large-scale change efforts in healthcare, education, and the delivery of government services in global contexts. Now let's get started. Professor Leary. Welcome everyone. Joel and I are delighted to spend this period of time with you. And we will start with uh, just some frame setting with a few slides, and then we hope to have a very robust conversation and exchange. But let me just say something personally about why this topic means so much to me. I'm a healthcare professional. And as when we think about the status of healthcare over the last 10 to 15 years, both negotiations and change management have been essentially our day-to-day -day experience. From Massachusetts health reform here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to the Affordable Care Act at the national level in the United States, health systems have been receiving negotiations from political and social players and then having to change their internal operations and organizational structures. So we've been living some version of negotiated change for some time, now that much more accelerated with the COVID pandemic. Joel. Like Kim, I'm delighted to be here. And the pandemic immediately raised for me questions about some of the parties with whom I've been working on change initiatives. In California, the Kaiser Permanente healthcare system is the nation's largest private system. And it's known for its labor management partnerships. Both the Alliance of Healthcare Unions and the Coalition are two groups that together cover unions representing 100,000 employees. Here in Massachusetts, UMass Memorial has a partnership with the SHARE Union in the center part of the state. And my thought as we went into the pandemic was what difference would these partnerships make? And in talking to the parties, what I've heard, not surprisingly, is that the difficult negotiations over safety, over flexibility with hours and job rules and all the rest have gone better, not just because of goodwill, but because of the history of folks working together. 
But the question that's now on my mind and the question that in a sense motivates the conversation we're about to have is are there change models, are there tools and methods, are there negotiations principles that will help the parties not just navigate the crisis, critical as it is, but to set the stage for a recovery afterwards that leaves them stronger? And so that's a motivating question in my mind as we go into it. Kim? Terrific. So I think we can start the slides, Joel. Great. So we're gonna be presenting um, the rule of three and let me kick it over to Joel to describe why that frame is the one that we'll be using going forward. Yeah, as we put um, our thoughts together on this, uh, first of all, it, this summer, Kim and I will be co-leading a PON seminar on negotiated change and this presentation built draws from some of those materials. And we decided to adopt the rule of three. We're gonna present you three of the many challenges that are facing healthcare in this pandemic. We're also gonna pick three of the many negotiations principles that are relevant in this conversation. And finally, uh, we picked three of the six change management models that we'll be using in the seminar. Uh, two of which are well known and one of which is actually a new model that's in development. Uh, and we'll be then taking the three challenges, the three principles and the three models and weaving them together uh, before we open it up for discussion. Kim. So on to the three public health challenges of, of many that we're struggling with right now. Uh, what you see here is probably the most watched curve uh, line in our immediate day-to-day -day experience. It comes from public health and it's called an epidemic curve. Uh, we know that the public health advice that we've received to use cloth masks when we're out and about, uh, to engage in frequent hand washing, and now also to practice uh, consistent physical distancing is widely considered to be advice that will keep us all safe. But it's important to understand that against the backdrop of this epidemic curve. Essentially, this curve tracks disease outbreak over time. And it's a graphic representation of new outbreaks by the date of the onset of the disease. But perhaps the most important line here is the dotted line, which represents hospital capacity the number of beds that are available, staffing, and other measures that, that indicate that a health system is able to provide the care needed. Now, before COVID-19, most healthcare systems in the US were working at near capacity. Physical distancing, as important as it is to general public health, is really about protecting the hospital's working capacity. And so the goal of physical distancing is not just to prevent infection, but it's really to protect the health system's ability to care for patients. But as we think about physical distancing, it's also important to know that it's not the same as social distancing. So we've included here an image from Italy of people under physical distancing rules who are still finding ways to connect with one another just as we have the clap outs for healthcare workers in New York City and here in Boston as well. Let me hand it over to you, Joel. So that's a large societal challenge. And uh, the second one that we're posing is not as visible, but it's an important one. What you see on this slide is an image of a fab lab or a makerspace. This happens to be a fab lab in Iceland where people come to design and make things it's more of a space to be inventive, uh, to get digital literacy. Uh, there's 2,000 of them in the world, uh, fab labs. They're in schools, libraries, community centers. But when the crisis hit, what were educational and developmental spaces suddenly became production operations. And you see an image of uh, protective gear, PPE gear that's been made in a fab lab. Uh, in Italy, uh, one of these spaces uh, was called upon when the hospital supply chain broke down to make 500 spare parts for their ventilators. And the folks in Italy that I've talked to say they're still working fine. And so a second challenge is how to take what are hobby 
creational literacy kinds of spaces and have them lean in and become productive operations in a crisis. The third challenge uh, is something that is less visible, but that is an important behavioral challenge, which is that there's tons of data, models, and resources associated with predicting the pandemic with different medical um, uh, developments in terms of therapies of various kinds. And there have been massive calls to create platforms for the open sharing of data, uh, fundamentally breaking norms um, to help address the crisis. And that's the third challenge that we're going to highlight here. Kim? So we've given you the first of our threes of looking at the public health challenge of COVID from the perspective of large scale behavior change to looking at how to surge production of PPE and then how to think about the open sharing of data and models to move forward. Now we'll look at three principles from negotiation theory, which are likely widely familiar to all of you, but I'll mention them each in brief. The first is a principle that comes from perhaps the most straightforward, elegant, and practical of the models associated with the program on negotiation, that of interest-based bargaining. And of course, the principle here is, the, is that it's critical to distinguish positions, the outcomes that people say they want to achieve in a negotiation, from their interest, the underlying needs, desires, concerns that lead them to particular positions. And in taking that integrative approach, of course, one has to engage in a process of surfacing what those distinct interests are so that one can identify opportunities for trade-offs and for joint gains. Now, the second negotiation principle that we want to draw our collective attention to is that of the importance of taking into account that negotiation actors are also prone to everyday forms of bias and um, cognitive errors, we might say. Under the best of conditions, we will all make those errors. And it's wise to notice that in advance to try to develop a corrective. For instance, we know that negotiators are very prone to ordinary cognitive errors, such as, um, thinking about the fundamental attribution error, the way in which we assume that what a person says comes from their internal psychology uh, rather than pressures on them in the environment. Likewise, a critical source of bias that comes up uh, on the other side has to do with um, how we, who we authorize in a negotiation context who we treat as the right person to engage in a conversation. And our colleagues, uh, Debbie Kolb, Iris Bonet, and others have helped us to appreciate the way in which power and gender and other dimensions of identity uh, come into play when we're trying to decide who counts in our negotiation space. Over to you, Joel. So the third principle uh, that we're highlighting is that uh, for every agreement in a negotiation, there's actually multiple agreements needed. There's an old adage in labor negotiations that one agreement takes three, one within labor, within management, and one across. And most parties will tell you that the internal negotiations are often harder than the ones across. In this crisis, as we'll see, many of the negotiations are multilateral bargains. So there's end parties, and essentially the core principle is that any one agreement takes N plus one agreements, at least one within each of the separate stakeholders or parties, and that doesn't even take into account coalitions. Kim. So as we begin our journey of trying to create a bridge from negotiation theory and frameworks to change management, it's worth noting uh, where we are in that kind of an endeavor. Much of our theory about negotiation and our frameworks focus on the micro, the kind of granular exchanges that take place between individuals or small groups. When we think about change management frameworks, the vast majority of those have been created to and operationalized within a much larger context, that of an organization or even a larger system. 
So as we begin this conversation, it will be important for us to recognize that we have to think from the micro to the meso and consider how we can begin to build a bridge between those two perspectives. Joel. So those are three negotiations principles, the second set of three. Uh, here's the third. This is a set of change management models. Um, and the first one, I'll turn it back to you, Kim, is a fairly well-known traditional model. Yes. So the first model that we'll discuss is John Cotter's top-down model of change, largely in organizational context. Now, what's interesting about change management is that they all start with a current state of affairs, and they point us to a desired future state. But the models differ on the transformation process in between. Absolutely. Now, Cotter's model begins with the idea that there is a person in a leadership or authority role who is able to sponsor and, in fact, drive the change through that organizational context. And the process includes that leader enlisting people in a shared vision and empowering them to translate that vision into more granular activities that further bring other people on board. Essentially, the leader is creating a spread of change and looking to find ways to anchor that change in the procedures, processes, and activities of that organization so that in the end, the change process results in a new and altered culture. Back over to you, Joe. So a second model uh, comes from a Ford executive leadership training program, although uh, it really has roots in the Kubler-Ross um, model of death and dying. Um, and it is basically a model on the left-hand axis that says, how confident are you? And it points out not how people drive change from the top down, which was our first model, but instead how change impacts people, so to speak, from the bottom up. And it traces shock and then perceived confidence going up as people are in denial, then increasing awareness and ultimately admitting that you don't know what you don't know at a point of acceptance, and then going on to experimentation, understanding and integration. And needless to say, um, this is a model that builds on um, William Bridges' concept that you need to let go of the old before you can accept the new. And if I can just add one other dimension of this, Joel, when we think about denial, it's worth remembering that denial is not um, a, a binary, that you either in denial or out of denial, except in a very specific clinical context. More often than not, uh, when we see denial, it's that people are engaged in siloed thinking and they're not aware uh, of how to connect the dots between different perspectives or frameworks or even models that they're putting into play. Yeah, thanks, Kim. And in fact, sometimes even people are in denial because they know things that you don't and that in fact, um, you need to shift some of your change uh, expectations. But that's a second model. Those two models are fairly well known uh, or versions of them. Uh, the third model is a new one that we've been working on. I've been part of a group looking at stakeholder alignment in complex systems. And just to give you a historical context, the first work that led to this VERT model was about 10 years ago. I was part of a team when Congress came to MIT to say, what could we do about aircraft noise and emissions? It's a different topic, a different time. But at that time, the US was spending $500 million on this subject, all of which was going to insulate homes near airports. And there was a view that half a billion dollars could be better spent in preventative ways. So we identified uh, over two dozen stakeholders. We interviewed them to understand their interests, the first stage of this model. We identified the deep value propositions that were at stake for these parties. We constructed what we thought was a shared vision, but in fact, um, there were hundreds of comments for and against different parts of what was in that document at a summit session. We had a second summit, and as someone trained in labor relations, I literally saw people engaged in collective bargaining. Um, and um, 
they negotiated agreements that led to a report back to Congress that was unanimous across the stakeholders. A set of uh, working groups were formed as part of the Next Generation Air Transportation Initiative. And a decade later, those efforts are still uh, going on where the parties maintain their separate identities, but they're working together in certain areas of mutual interest. And so this is what we call a middle across model where the parties maintain their independent identities, but they are laterally or horizontally aligned to work together to do what they can't do separately. And if I can just uh, add another comment, uh, Joel, you know, this middle across change is also resonant with some of the principles of adaptive leadership taught by our colleague Ronnie Heifetz over at the Kennedy School. And just as you describe here, there's a collective problem that, that the stakeholders all share, but each stakeholder looks at the problem in a somewhat different way. So they also identify a solution that is somewhat distinct. And in order for progress to be made, the parties have to decide where can they make certain trade-offs in order to be able to uh, identify a pathway that's going to meet as many of their interests as possible. Yeah, and that's a good segue, Kim, into this additional slide. For just the first step of this model, mapping stakeholders and interests, um, we have found it's helpful to think of a space, a shared space among multiple parties as a matrix, a matrix with the different stakeholders on one side and the different interests or the things that are at stake on the other. So if you think of the first negotiations principle, the interest-based bargaining, it's basically saying that there are many interests at play. And in this heat map, folks who are positive on something are green, neutral is yellow, and negative is red. When we do stakeholder maps, we have an organization um, that is set up to do that. Uh, we also ask not only how important is something, but how difficult is it? Uh, and you begin to see the whole ecosystem within which you can identify points of alignment or misalignment. So that's a third model. Now we have the task of putting it all together. Kim, why don't you lead us back to the Cotter model with negotiations, um, principles, and change management concepts to, woven together. Right. You know, it's worth uh, recalling Peter Drucker's famous aphorism that culture eats strategy for breakfast and reminding ourselves that so many of our change initiatives unfortunately fail. We think that taking a negotiation perspective to change management may improve the odds of success. For example, let's look at Cotter's top-down change model in the context of COVID-19. Even in the current crisis, um, there is a sense of urgency, but we're not all urgent about the same things. For many stakeholders, COVID-19 is primarily a healthcare challenge or a population behavior change challenge. But for others, we're increasingly recognizing that it's also simultaneously an economic problem and a significant one. And then others, social activists, are very well aware of the social dimensions of COVID. So establishing a sense of urgency doesn't mean just one thing. And in fact, that sense of urgency may need to be negotiated into what ultimately becomes a vision for change. Likewise, when we think about a, a strategy, uh, the strategy itself may need to be negotiated depending on what elements are to be prioritized and also the relative value that we place on science and empirical work for most of us, that's very high. For others, their differing views have to be taken into account if we need their participation in moving forward. So uh, we have to think about uh, even the elements of change, uh, the change process as being amenable to negotiated processes as well. Joel. Thanks, Kim. So our second model um, raises a number of additional negotiations challenges. The first one, is the question of how do you bargain with folks who are in denial? Just using logic alone will, won't, will not necessarily be what prevails. And as people move into awareness, or if you want to help people move to that point, what are the kinds of evidence uh, that will be 
helpful for people to understand that they are seeing things with bias of one kind or another, as Kim mentioned earlier. And just to complete the cycle, uh, there's various kinds of negotiations around what constitutes successful and evident experimentation. Um, so many parts of this uh, bottom-up change model have negotiated dimensions that we are highlighting. Just to take, go to the third model for a few minutes, we'll just stay on the mapping of stakeholders and interests. Um, what I've put here is sort of a cartoon version of some stakeholders and some interests that are at stake in Massachusetts. Um, normally, we would carefully frame the interest in a way that is seen as neutral expressions of the issue, whether people are positive or negative, um, avoiding the positions and getting to the underlying interest. I put them here in just big um, short versions of the words to be readable as a slide. But on this hypothetical slide, we have some interest in which the states that are ahead in the pandemic are prioritizing social distancing over economics. But back in February, they had a, we all had a president who was uh, still focusing more on the economics. And so we had some interests that were in tension. Um, similar, we had leading experts showing up, but the question was, how do we understand the negotiated ways in which they can establish their legitimacy? And so by seeing the stakeholder of it, uh, map, you begin to understand the territory. Just again, in the hypothetical, I drew the second map of what it might look like a month later in March when a lot of the interests shift and a, a, an issue that wasn't on the agenda honoring healthcare workers suddenly became a massive point of alignment in society. Um, and so this really poses the question, as you negotiate change, how do you manage the shifting territory of stakeholders and interests? Kim. So let's try to put it all together and go back to our three challenges and see how we might think through a negotiation lens and also uh, through change management frameworks. So we have a crisis that is itself multi-layered and involves considerable interdependencies. Let's start first with looking at instituting physical distancing in society. So a change management model may be really helpful for some of the new challenges people are experiencing around making sure that they can get food and supplies. So uh, in the food services organizations, a top-down Cotter style model um, leavened with the elements of negotiation that we've mentioned before uh, may be quite effective in being able to drive new processes, new ways of understanding the core business as well as executing it. We also and I, might, I might add that that is absolutely true within the four walls of a food service organization. Some of the multi-stakeholder issues in the whole food value chain would take us to the coalition stakeholder alignment model. Um, so top-down change depends on within the structure of a hierarchy. Absolutely. Thank you, Joel. And, you know, we also see with physical distancing in society, we see the emergence of two coalitions, one uh, emerging opposition, and we might look at those who are protesting stay at home orders as being in different stages of shock and denial. And in order to work with those groups, it's going to be necessary to recognize where they are in this cycle and to create new opportunities, hopefully, to enable them to understand that we have a new set of parameters in play. We also see the emergence of new lateral coalitions uh, in the face of contradictory and sometimes confusing information at the federal level. Uh, we see governors uh, across the nation who are coming together to uh, coordinate their own plans, hopefully in alignment with federal efforts. And there, they will be needing to work across their, their uh, different states and across the different coalitions of governors that we see in the Northeast, in um, Midwest, and then on the East Coast. Turn it over to you, Joel. So with the second challenge, uh, this surging of production on the part of small entrepreneurial entities and uh, educational spaces, 
again, all three models come into play. First, we do have large companies, Ford, 3M, and others, that are doing within the four walls type transformation, and they're going to draw on a Cotter style model of change. We also have some interesting dynamics. Uh, the folks in Italy, uh, who I've been talking to in terms of their fab lab networks, uh, have saved the day in part for hospitals, but what's happened is some of the national regulators have issued them cease and desist orders on producing medical devices. And I've been listening into conversations at MIT on this whole network of these fab lab and maker folks uh, who are surging production in this country and around the world. And the simple point here is that the scientists and the fabricators are moving at an accelerating pace. They are surging forward. But many of the institutional actors are still operating at a linear or slower pace. And so the dynamics of shock and denial are happening among regulators who are trying to keep up with what's happening on the ground. And lastly, uh, that Italy case was really an alignment of a fabrication ecosystem with a healthcare ecosystem. And we see many versions of that all around this country in which uh, self-sufficient production is kind of emerging as a whole new thing in society. Uh, the last challenge, just to highlight it, is um, to look at this open sharing of data. Uh, so I've had the privilege of working with a team for a half dozen years studying the open sharing of data in science. We were doing this work uh, before, of course, the crisis. And what we saw then and what's happening with more intensity now is that the data centers, the folks with the platforms for sharing, are having to use Cotter style models to prepare for a massive increase in the amount and types and diversity of data that's being shared and the diverse users that are coming to access data models and tools. Uh, and deep under it are some deeply embedded proprietary views. Back before the crisis, when we did stakeholder mapping surveys of scientists, we got back some very strong views. Uh, I'll mention just one qualitative comment. It's kind of frightening in this context, but a fellow wrote, that when you, if you want my data, you can pry it from my cold dead hands when I'm gone. Uh, that's of course a strong view, but the point is in a crisis, people are beginning to share what used to be seen as proprietary, commercial companies and researchers. Um, but the question is what happens to IP afterwards and how do we manage those dynamics? And lastly, of course, among the various folks that are facilitating the sharing, they need forms of lateral alignment. So these negotiated dynamics are woven through all three of our challenges. Yes. Back to you, Kim. So we're delighted now to begin to open up this conversation to all of you. We are thinking about the COVID crisis now, but we're also thinking about the recovery and resiliency de development phases ahead. And before we turn to a more open forum, what we'd like to do is try to capture questions, thoughts, and comments, succinct ones at this stage, so that we can capture them on the slide. And then once we have a sense of what's on your top of mind, we're gonna uh, transition to a more open conversation where you'll be able to um, share what you're thinking in response to uh, the conversation that we've started. So I might say, I have actually two slides that you'll see. One has COVID on the top, the other has negotiated change. And so uh, as Kim uh, interacts with you in terms of your comments, I hope it's not whiplash as I go back and forth, but we'll be using that as kind of a virtual flip chart with me as your scribe and Kim as your facilitator to capture some of your thoughts. Uh, and then we'll open it up as suggested. Okay. And our colleagues at PON will help us to uh, identify who would like to get into the conversation first. And again, just to motivate your comments or questions, we have a top-down, bottom-up, and middle-out model of change. We have three core negotiations principles, and we have three very big challenges facing society. <laughs> 
Terrific. It looks like the first of our virtual hands has been raised. That's great. Uh, Luis, or would you like yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, yes. sure. Or I just wanted to unmute it. Um, so how will it will be negotiated uh, between companies and, and governments or states to define or decide whether the vaccine will be open to everybody or some pharmaceutical companies will manage it or some country will say, well, we will save the rest of you, hmm, who cares? So it will be open to everybody or privately or publicly managed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Luis. And Kerry, Michael Meadow. So this is a big one, you guys. You know, um, I spent many years in Washington. Um, and I so appreciate the Kubler-Ross, but what if it's um, uh, a denial that doesn't have stages? And you know of whom I speak. It is our national leadership. So my question, if you want to know how to just frame the question very simply, um, how do you deal really with um, intransigent politics? All of us in negotiation, you know, we spend our lives teaching, uh, training, interests, and as Joel and you have suggested, Kim, uh, are either a rational process or one that acknowledges that some change is possible. Um, from what I see, from where I sit, um, involved in national politics, it is the challenge for this is at the macro level for me. I mean, all, the, all the other questions are incredibly important. Thank you guys, this has been fabulous. So I just wanna put on the table, you know, when, when, what do you do when you really meet an Im immovable force? Okay, um, terrific. Politics. <laughs> Let me just call on someone from the chat. Maren, if you might ask your question to all of us, that would be terrific. Yes, uh, so I was really interested in how you use the model, uh, the bottom-up change model, and you mentioned that uh, you probably need to negotiate in different ways uh, for different stages in the model. So maybe it's outside the scope of this meeting, I don't know, but I'm just got really curious about uh, some suggestions for how to negotiate at the different levels. Okay. Stages. Okay. So we're having a couple of questions here that are coming in around stages, uh, which is important to see. Let's, uh, let's go to Mark, from, uh, who has a virtual hand raised. Mark Menvit. Yes, thank you. Uh, Apologies for the background noise. Um, one of the difficulties uh, I think we have here uh, is the fact that this uh, pandemic is so uh, far reaching. And so typically we would map out stakeholders and map out interests. And in this case, everybody in the world is a stakeholder. Uh, and uh, you know, everybody has similar interests, I'm sure. There are many overlapping interests and then divergent interests as well. And with a situation where everybody's involved and the data uh, that pertains to particular groups or subgroups of people is so varied. Uh, I, I wonder how you fit something like that into a change model, uh, you know, that, that would be able to fit on a single terabyte. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure how you capture all that data and, and make use of it in a, in a material way. Thank you. So Mark, you're raising, raising a really critical question about um, uh, a large scale pandemic challenge that in, potentially involves everyone as a stakeholder. And how do we begin to then use our theory about change and frameworks to begin to make some sense of that because it assumes that there's stakeholders and others. And now there's a challenge to that in the current situation. Terrific. Um, I think there's another uh, comment in the chat that uh, maybe speaks to some of this. Uh, Roger Benson raises a question. Roger, would you like to bring your question forward? Yes. I'm, I'm just wondering how, how you begin a, a conversation. Um, I think that the first speaker touched on this. Uh, how, how do you begin a conversation between um, the, um, I, I say on the one hand, uh, the, the data-driven people who seek out rational explanations and those who are 
unwilling to listen and hostile. I, I, just as an example, there are people who appeared on the steps of the Capitol in Michigan with long guns and automatic rifles. And um, that's the reality, it's different than the academic view of it. But how do you start that conversation? Okay. Right. Where very different frames of reference exist. Right. Yes. We have a comment from Germany. Uh, is it Hagen? Hagen, could you join us and uh, share your question? Yeah, my name is Hagen. Um, we are we are working on conflicts in municipalities, and um, we notice that those stakeholders and those actors uh, who have been um, powerless and or or with very little power in the past, they get more powerless um, at the moment. And um, so I'm wondering if a bottom, a, a top down approach wouldn't work with this because they are not listened to and they don't have a, a holding, especially in East Germany where right wing parties dominate some of the municipalities. Uh, so uh, in the aftermath of uh, the crisis, how to, to bring them in for change uh, without uh, disregarding maybe um, uh, the, the social issues uh, relating relating to the crisis. Okay, very important point. Another uh, distinction among uh, people that uh, and communities that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, Camilla Novak, what is your thought or question? Thank you. I hope I managed to unmute myself. Um, since I'm working in the life science industry, my question is more related to this part. What we've seen uh, is a unprecedented gathering of pharma and biotech companies willing to collaborate, to cooperate and giving each other resources and participating into projects all together, like putting really aside um, all the competition, which I think is extremely good thing. But uh, just this morning I was reading uh, the medical panel of NIH uh, actually giving advice against every single uh, treatment which is being tried. Uh, so this, I believe, can create enormous confusion uh, when the medical staff, for the public, uh, for, uh, let's say, the public within the healthcare sector. So I'm wondering how to handle such a situation because it really will see enormous efforts on one hand and then just stepping up the panel saying all you do is wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Very important set of challenges. Let's get a few more in, Joel, and then maybe yeah, open I up think we should then make comments on some of these. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. Um, uh, Gabrielle was trying to ask a question, but wasn't sure how to raise a virtual hand, but I think has figured that out. So. Uh, yes. Please go ahead. Um, hi, Kimberly. Actually, my question goes back a bit to one of the first um, questions that was raised. It's more, and I'm coming from the European point of view, is that we now see governments talking to one another on the European level, and there is a clear um, a disengagement from the North European countries towards the South European countries. And I think um, if you look at the news, you see that on a daily basis. I live at the heart of Brussels, and I see it that actually they cannot come to an agreement because the North of Europe doesn't want to, for example, unleash the, uh, the funds for, uh, for emergency to help the certain countries who have been very much hit by the, uh, by the pandemic. And how can these um, theories for change management to, to, how are they implementable? I know that's not a word, but I just made one. How, how can that be implemented on such a big scale? Because we're talking about uh, billions of people and also billions of, uh, of euros that are involved but that are not being um, unlocked to be able to help those people and therefore blocking the municipalities and any other um, yeah any other procedure that can happen through that. Okay. Hi, um, I'm, I'm going I'm to suggest maybe we'll take if you want one more but then you should take on some of these questions and I'll take on some uh, and then uh, we'll do the other slide and do the same and then still open it up if there's any more um, at This point less questions and more comments from those who are online who want to contribute Yeah, I might suggest Joel that um, 
we can use the questions and comments as also a starting point for discussion with our colleagues. I don't know about you, but I don't have ready-made answers to these big questions that uh, people are proposing, but maybe some, uh, it, through some exchange, we will in fact have so, uh, a way forward, some new ideas. Okay, um, so let's have Paula Gutlove, who was the last of our uh, uh, hands that we'll be able to take. And then we'll, 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 we will hold on to the questions from the chat. They're excellent ones and make sure that we uh, review those and try to respond to them as we can in the time we have left. Paula. Well, thank you, Kim, and thank you, Joel. This has been a really fascinating conversation. Um, my question is more about the, the big picture of trust and compliance mechanisms, and how do those work in uh, negotiating change when you have so many stakeholders and an embedded lack of trust and uh, I think an, an urgency where you don't have time to build the trust while the change is happening. So just putting in this concern about the need to build trust, the need to build in compliance mechanisms, and how does this work when you're negotiating an urgent an emergency situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, so Kim, I think I'll make a few comments on uh, some of these questions and sure. um, you may want to as well. And then as you say, we'll open it up. Um, uh, so I'll actually talk about both slides, uh, not every question, but, but there's a common theme that cuts across quite a few of them, which is this is such a big and complicated challenge with issues of power, uh, and other dynamics and so many stakeholders and so many interests, uh, how do we go forward? And I'll make an observation, which is that institutions in society are the product of pattern behavior. And what we're seeing are new patterns emerge in this crisis. And those patterns are precious uh, because right now they are built on goodwill but there are also some competing dynamics, which we'll get to. But the important thing that I would say is to not view it as one big negotiation, but rather there's a variety of ecosystems within which there are defined stakeholders and interests, and there are new forms of alignment that are emerging. Um, and each one is complex and difficult, and the alignment across them is even more complex and more difficult but it's not unsolvable. And so the thought is that within many of these entities, they will need some of these Cotter models of top-down change. There is certainly these bottom-up dynamics and the particular puzzle that, that, uh, that Carrie has posed, which is what about people who are just embedded in denial, um, is one that uh, is a particular challenge. Uh, what I would say is that when folks are stuck in denial like that, there is a vacuum for leadership. And what we see is emerging coalitions among governors and others, which ironically have more in common with some of the national, international NGOs than does do nation states. And so the short version is that there's a variety of ecosystem level negotiations that need the benefits of a more interest-based approach with attendance to the internals as well as the externals and attendance to the biases that are going on. But the larger question is whether those dynamics can, in a sense, be reinforced with more intentional change such that the patterns that are more productive persist in, in a sense, a new set of institutional arrangements afterwards. And I would just add to that as well, that uh, from our colleagues in crisis management and crisis leadership, they remind us that though this is an unprecedented challenge that we're facing right now, in, it's not the first time uh, that epidemics and illness have crossed borders and where innovation has had to take place in real time. So our colleagues in crisis management 
suggest that an important dimension of being able to respond to a challenge like this one is also to look in the past because there are some dimensions of the Ebola crisis, for example, or even further back in history with the uh, flu of 1918 that are relevant to beginning to organize ourselves in the present. So we have um, a set of challenges. We have some um, information from the past that we can rely on towards exactly what Joel mentioned, looking to see at the new emerging coalitions and uh, frameworks that cross some of our traditional borders like change management and negotiation to see what they might raise and to the surface for our careful consideration and, um, and application in an experimental way to see what new information they yield. Yeah, and um, again, I wanna open it up, as you said, for some additional comments from folks on this webinar. Um, but I would also add that the question, what strategies are relevant at different stages of the bottom-up model, I really wanna lift that up. Because in fact, at different stages of denial versus uh, experimentation versus other stages, they are very different kinds of negotiations. And you know, one of the things um, that will be part of the agenda for the seminar that we've planned is to really unpack a range of different strategy structures and tactics that are relevant at different phases of a change process. Uh, because it is not just a single kind of negotiation. Yes. So let's let's open this up to Tracy, who uh, has a virtual hand raised. Hi. Um, I come from um, education, and so um, for me, and and I, I I hear all these amazing questions. Um, but I'm so focused on education because that's where we're living right now. Um, and I, you know, right now the, the teams are all together. We're all in crisis. We're, we're solving problems with uh, distance learning and um, the needs of the students, you know, definitely are coming first. Um, but as we move forward um, and are, and I come from California, um, we, you know, the, the, the challenges that we face in regards to our negotiations uh, for financial reasons, um, a new way of learning, having to change the, our classrooms possibly as we try to phase teachers and students back in, uh, and we don't even know when that's going to happen, um, and also the being able to, uh, what we negotiate affects the Social, social, emotional learning of students. So there, it's such a broad, big challenge in education um, in regards to so many different layers um, in negotiating with our, our partners and our, our teachers and, and all staff. Um, so I, I find um, it a little bit overwhelming um, as well in using and adapting to the models available. Tracy, um, if I could just um, invite maybe you to say a little bit more. It is overwhelming. That, that does make sense. But as you've thought about that set of negotiations, what has been helpful to you in at least organizing your thinking? Well, in, in this, just really, um, really looking at the, the strategies um, that we can use to but I think the most important um, is really understanding where they're coming from, the, 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 the adapt, the, how the teachers have had to adapt, um, how the students have had to adapt, how, how the administrative staff has had to adapt. So really listening to them to see it might be a whole new set of uh, needs and challenges um, that, that are going to surface through this that we haven't thought of on, on our management team. So even a, a deeper uh, form of listening to yes. affected communities and constituents to surface yes. what their interests are, to make sure that they're represented 
uh, in the mm -hmm. conversations and negotiations going forward. Yeah, Thank you. Right. In fact, I might add, you know, when we do the stakeholder alignment work, um, once you've mapped the stakeholders and the interest, figuring out the value propositions, what is the bundle of things that each stakeholder brings to the conversation. You know, when people launch entrepreneurial businesses, they say, what's your one value proposition? But in these multilateral settings, there are dozens of value propositions that each bundle of stakeholders, in a sense, brings. And they overlap. There are common interests, but there are also competing interests. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one step towards it being perhaps a little less overwhelming is just stepping back to, to see where people are coming from, as you nicely put it, um, to, to get your mental map of what's the territory in which we're operating. And if I can just add one other um, reflection that's coming to mind, especially from the questions and comments about different groups that seem, uh, it seems impossible to bridge the differences. It reminds me of what we were talking about earlier around some of our cognitive biases and identity biases of who counts in a conversation and who does not. While there's certainly um, groups uh, and entities that we may not feel we have any way of understanding what they're trying to tell us. It could be that if we listen, again, a bit harder, we may find that the anxiety of those in certain socioeconomic strata around what it means to be staying at home for an extended period of time, when that means clearly that uh, their own material well-being will deeply suffer, is worth thinking about that those intransigent attitudes may come from deep-seated interests that we might be able to uh, address. Uh, and when people feel, we all know this, when people feel that their urgencies are heard, they often become somewhat more amenable to engaging with us. Mm -hmm. I, actually, um, if I could key off of what you just said, Kim, in negotiations, we often talk about a pre-stage, which we call bargaining over how to bargain or bargaining over the ground rules or bargaining over the rules of the game. And in a lot of these cases, both the negotiations principles and the change models have the power of leveling some of the power differences by giving legitimacy to different stakeholders and interest uh, and so on. Um, and so in this crisis, the ability to create forums even before we have these conversations to talk about how do we want to have the conversation becomes really important because there will be complicated issues. But if we can at least agree on a process, a change process, a set of negotiations principles, in a sense, putting the two pieces together going forward, that agreement or the bargaining over how to bargain then sets the stage for the likelihood of better mutual gains outcomes. And mm -hmm. let me also add that, you know, all of us in our communities of practice have had to move from a version of shock and denial, maybe shock in different forms and denial of different things, but uh, to begin to say, here are the big questions. We don't know what to do, but we need to figure out ways to begin to organize our activity, to uh, respond uh, in the different sectors and across sectors seems to me quite important work and a version of finding ourselves in the very challenges that we see in others. Super. Thank well, you. I see that we're close to time and I know Susan has a final word for all of us, um, but let me say that um, we will take, uh, the folks at PON will copy everything that's in the chat and we'll add them to the slide deck so that it'll be a more complete set of comments and questions, um, which is what uh, will be available, I guess, by email through PON. Um, but uh, Kim, uh, final word before we hand it back to Susan? You know, just your final slide, Joel, uh, which is our best wish for all of you to take care out there, to take care of yourselves and take care of your communities. Over to you, Susan. Thank you, Joel and Kim, for a wonderful hour full of ideas and frameworks and ways of thinking about some topics that are just so difficult to think about how each of us as individuals and with our organizations and our communities can help 
in this crisis time. And thank you to all of you who uh, participated, who gave questions and comments. And we um, invite you to look at the program that Joel and Kim will be doing in July. We'll have something up on our website pretty soon. It'll be an online program, full day. And on, the pro on behalf of the program on negotiation at Har Harvard Law School, I wish you all well. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Take good care, all. Yes, take care. Bye-bye.